You're welcome to our, uh, to our lecture this evening, which is on the, uh, the topic of the Army Mutiny of 1924, the first in a short series of uh, lectures under the general theme of uh, Irish political crises in the post-independence era. And uh, our second lecture will concern the, what was t what's typically referred to as the mother and child controversy or the mother and child crisis of uh, 1951, in which uh, the then Minister for Health uh, attempted to institute a universal form of free health care for children and postpartum mothers, which met significant resistance from elements within the Irish Catholic hierarchy and amongst uh, certain elements of the medical profession and precipitated a controversy within that government, which arguably contributed to that government's fall. Our third lecture will be on the topic of the arms crisis of 1970, which occurred in the, uh, amidst the con within the context of the outbreak of significant and serious intercommunal strife in Northern Ireland at the, in the late 1960s. And it was a particularly fraught time for Irish democracy because um, it was alleged then, as it is now, that elements within the then Irish political establishment and the government itself uh, conspired to import arms illegally <clears throat> into this state for the purposes of supplying them to nationalist elements in Northern Ireland. And it was a crisis which precipitated the resignation of two ministers from the government and the dismissal of two others. And then our final lecture will concern the topic of the relatively short-lived and ill-fated um, minority government of uh, Fianna Fáil, uh, led by Charles Haughey, the so-called Gubu government of 1982. This was a, an administration that endured for, I suppose, as long as it could endure, uh, a veritable cacophony of controversies, um, scandals and political intrigues, ranging from the leaks of confidential information from the cabinet table, to the illegal tapping of journalist phones, to the alleged attempt to pervert the course of justice in a court case involving the, the then Justice Minister's brother-in-law, and finally to the very brutal and tragic murders of a young nurse in Dublin and a farming man in the Midlands by a gentleman called Malcolm MacArthur. The controversial aspect of that being that uh, after evading authorities for a number of weeks, MacArthur was eventually found and arrested in an apartment in Dublin, an apartment in which he was a guest, and an apartment which was then the Dublin residence of the then Attorney General to the Irish government. So as you can imagine, that particular government didn't last much long after that controversy. So if any of you, all of you that's here, are interested in coming to any of those lectures whenever we, we hold them, please feel free to return to us, and of course bring your friends. And make sure Dar is here, that's, it's very important that, that, that Dar is here anyway. So, on to the uh, matter of uh, under discussion this evening more properly. The decision of a number of disgruntled Irish Army officers to issue what amounted to an ultimatum to the then President of the Executive Council, in other words our Taoiseach or Prime Minister, in 1924, was an occurrence, or perhaps uh, more accurately the culmination of a series of events that had significant effects on the relationship between the civilian authorities and the armed forces, on the careers of a number of key individuals, and almost certainly contributed to the longer-term decline of what was then Ireland's largest political party, Common and Wales. However, in order to fully appreciate the circumstances, the culture, and indeed the mindset, both of those men who adopted a mutinous approach in 1924, and also of those who moved to suppress this dissent within the army, it is necessary to look further back to before the establishment of the Irish army, and indeed to, be, to the period before the establishment of the state itself. The Irish Army today, just as in 1924, regards itself as the direct successor of the Irish Volunteer Movement founded in late 1913, at a time in which the prospect of Ireland finally receiving some form of home rule seemed likely. Though established, at least in part, as a reaction to the emergence of the Ulster Volunteers, who sought to prevent the uh, implementation of home rule, the leadership of the Irish Volunteers, under its first leader, Owen O'Neill, uh, sought to ensure that any Irish national government that was successfully established uh, would, have, would find within the Volunteers a disciplined, trained and committed body of men who could, in effect, act as the army of this new Irish uh, polity. The growth of the Volunteers was rapid, 
and by mid-1914 it had approximately uh, 180,000 members. It is important to note that at its inception, this organisation, the organisation that was in some ways the progenitor of the Irish Army that existed in 1924, was independent of any civilian authority. Granted, one can argue uh, that naturally, naturally you can argue that virtually all of its original leadership and its members were, uh, strictly speaking, civilians. Nevertheless, the lack of a specific governmental civilian oversight meant that from the very beginning, the climate within the volunteers allowed for the development of a culture of independence, of autonomy, and of self-reliance. And it allowed for the emergence of a mindset that may have been less than enthused by outside political direction. Moreover, from its inception, the volunteers have been infiltrated extensively by the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the IRB. The IRB was a secret oath-bound organisation founded in the 1850s with the objective of establishing a republican form of government in Ireland. In other words, to effect total separation from the United Kingdom. As a militant, secret, conspiratorial and subversive organisation, the IRB influence within the early volunteer movement may have further aided in the growth of an independent or autonomous culture within sections of that organisation, a culture that made it all the more likely the, for the potential rejection of what might be perceived as improper, improper ineffective or un, unpatriotic civilian oversight later. An attempt by the then leadership of Ireland's largest political organisation, the Irish Parliamentary Party, to exert control over the volunteers in 1914 met with limited success. The party leader, John Redmond, succeeded in placing a large number of his nominees onto the governing committee of the volunteers. However, while this arguably meant that the volunteers were now subject to a certain or even significant level of what could be termed as civilian oversight or authority, in practice, the original leadership maintained effective control, at least until the movement split later in 1914, when the vast majority opted to leave the organisation and support Britain's war effort against the Central Powers in Europe during the First World War. Those who object objected to fighting in Europe remained within the volunteers. And though the movement was now reduced to a rump of approximately 11,000, it was a body within which the aforementioned culture of autonomy and potential opposition to political or outside interference gained even greater purchase. Additionally, it also meant that the conspiratorial and revolutionary IRB consolidated its influence. This increased IRB influence would see elements within the volunteers stage a rebellion against British rule in April 1916 in the hope, ostensibly at least, of establishing a sovereign, independent Irish Republic. Largely confined to Dublin, the Easter Rising was a military failure. British control of the island was never placed in serious doubt. However, the aftermath of the rebellion saw support for the ideal of establishing a sovereign Irish Republic, uh, separate and distinct from the United Kingdom, increase significantly. It led to the rejuvenation of the rump Irish volunteers, which by late 1918 had increased once again to approximately 100,000 men. In political terms, it also facilitated the rise of the Sinn Féin party, which, following its success in the general election of December 1918, opted to establish a secessionist parliament or doyle in Dublin in January 1919, at which they appointed a government and declared Ireland, Ireland an independent and sovereign republic. Needless to say, the British establishment did not recognise this Irish government or parliament and regarded both as illegal. On the same day that the secessionist parliament met Irish parliament, a number of Irish volunteers ambushed and killed two members of the Royal, Ulster, Royal Irish sorry, Constabulary, or police force, in what is typically regarded as the first engagement of the Irish War of Independence, which saw the Irish volunteers, soon to become known as the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, <coughs> engage in a guerrilla-type warfare against the uh, forces of the British Crown in Ireland. A struggle that would continue until a truce was called in July 1921, when negotiations between Sinn Féin leaders and representatives of the British government began in various forms to bring about a resolution to the conflict. Thus, a superficial, though very understandable, reading of this revolutionary period between 1919 and 1922 would lend towards the impression that in its capacity as the self-declared government of the Irish people, the Sinn Féin leadership exerted political or civilian control or authority over the IRA and that the IRA was there for the army, if you will, of this revolutionary Sinn Féin government. Such a view would be further bolstered by the fact that Eamon de Valera, 
was the official leader of both groups. He had been elected president of both Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers at separate conventions in 1917. And from 1919, he was the president of the Doyle, later president of the Revolution Republic, until January 1922. Moreover, in 1919, the IRA had pledged its allegiance to the, to the Doyle, the Parliament. Whilst in his capacity as head of government, de Valera had also appointed the 1916 veteran, Cahal Brua, as Minister for Defence, a position which, in theory, added a further layer of civilian authority over the IRA. However, despite this theoretical hierarchical structure, which denoted revolutionary civilian authority over the military, in practice, the IRA, IRA remained an autonomous organization throughout the War of Independence. Firstly, it should be noted that the Doyle itself did not take official responsibility for the IRA's collective actions until March 1921, a factor which, in the view of Professor Marianne Veloulis, who is the acknowledged authority on the Army Mutiny, uh, in a, according to Professor Veloulis, uh, led to a sceptical and distrustful attitude on the part of some IRA officers vis-à-vis -vis the government's ability and wisdom in making decisions affecting the military, a mindset that would survive into the establishment of the Free State Army. <coughs> Secondly, as both the Doyle and the Republican government had been proscribed by the British, those ministers who were not arrested or imprisoned early on spent most of this period evading British authorities and security services. This was not conducive, therefore, to ensuring that civilian authority, such as it was, could be affected over the IRA activity. Thirdly, the internal structure of the IRA itself allowed for individual units to elect their own officers. These officers then represented such units at army conventions, when they were held, though sporadically, and at which the senior members, and at which the senior members of the general headquarters staff, such as the chief of staff, the adjutant general, the quartermaster general, etc., were appointed following election. Consequently, the entire organization, appointment, and dismissal of leadership figures within the IRA or volunteer movement was in practice outside the control of or governance of civilian authority, at least as it was represented by the Sinn Féin government. This internalized method of selecting and appointing senior members of the army leadership would again aid in, gendering, in, in engendering a culture of autonomy and potential resistance to outside or unwelcome political oversight. Moreover, while the General Headquarters Staff, under the leadership of Richard Mulcahy, who had been elected Chief of Staff in March 1918, did sterling work in establishing the structures of command and overseeing IRA policy in the general sense, in practice much IRA activity throughout the country was directed solely by local commanders. As an illegal guerrilla army, which was in some respects pioneering a new form of asymmetrical warfare, at least in Western European terms. The individual units and flying columns of the IRA, particularly outside of the main urban areas, were largely left to their own devices. Matters relating to provisioning, billeting, tactics, the selection of targets, and importantly, the enforcement of discipline, were essentially the purview of the officer or officers in charge of their respective units. Despite having an official structure that was akin to that of a regular army, the IRA command structure was rather loose due to the circumstances of the time. And indeed, this loose structure arguably contributed or was a key factor to its success. Added to this, it should be noted that the IRA or volunteer officers, many of them, were also members of the IRB, which had also been rejuvenated and reorganised in the aftermath of the 1916 Rising. Michael Collins, who held the position of Minister for Finance within the Doyle government, as well as the position of Director of Intelligence and positions of Director of Intelligence and Organisation within the IRA or Volunteers, was also the dominant figure within the IRB. Thus, while within the IRA Collins was technically subordinate to Richard Mulcahy, as who was his Chief of Staff, in effect many of the IRB men within the IRA ranks took direction from Collins directly, rather than from Mulcahy on the basis of the former's leadership of the Republican Brotherhood. Now this is not to say that Collins's general approach or direction was in any way inimical to uh, Mulcahy's position as Chief of Staff. The evidence would suggest that they generally acted in relative concert. However, the continuing existence of the IRB structure within the revitalized volunteer movement would have served to further propagate a culture, or at least provide more fertile ground for the development of a culture or mindset of independence with respect to the concept of official political oversight.
This culture of independence with respect to civilian authority was to reach its very tragic apogee following the conclusion of negotiations between the Sinn Féin representatives and the British government in December 1921. The Anglo-Irish Treaty, which provided for a partitioned 26-county state and not the unitary republic desired by many, prompted a split within both the political Sinn Féin and the military, the IRA, sections of the independence movement. Whilst the majority of Sinn Féin delegates, in other words the civilian authority, accepted the treaty terms, the majority of the IRA did not. Again, whilst the majority of the officers within the general headquarters staff, the governing body of the IRA, did in fact support the treaty, uh, the aforementioned culture of independence and autonomy within the broader volunteer movement meant that many IRA men, and in many cases entire IRA units throughout the country opted to abjure both the principle of majoritarian democracy and the general policy of their own headquarters staff a circumstance that would lead to the outbreak of civil war between the pro- and anti-treaty sides in June 1922. But what of the rump IRA? What of those IRA men who had opted to accept the treaty and the establishment of the new state? Many of these were incorporated into and became the nucleus of the new free state or official Irish army established by Collins and Mulcahy during the early months of 1922. It was this new Free State Army which engaged in a vigorous recruitment drive that fought to suppress the violent dissent of the anti-treaty IRA or irregular forces, eventually neutralizing all serious violent dissent by roughly April 1923. So yes, the new Free State government, or the new Free State itself, had a parliament, or a doyle, and yes, the new Free State had an executive council, or government, elected by that parliament. But ultimately, it was the new Irish army that established the state, as it was this army which ensured that the terms of the treaty and the writ of the civilian authority could be effected throughout the country. The new Irish police force, the Civic Guard, later renamed on Garda Síochána, was in no position to ensure the rule of law during this period. And therefore, much of what we now understand to typically uh, have been the responsibility or should be the responsibility of the civil power, such as collecting rates or... Uh, seizing and returning stolen property or effecting court orders. Much of this remained the responsibility of the military throughout the Civil War period and indeed for a time thereafter. Importantly, this new army, much like its progenitor within the revolutionary IRA, had a somewhat amorphous relationship with the new civilian authority during the birthing period of the state. As aforementioned, the army was established by men such as Collins and Mulcahy, together with other loyal old IRA men. And whilst both Collins as Commander-in-Chief and Mulcahy as Chief of Staff and Minister for Defence were members of the government, and whilst the government was the de jure authority of the state, in reality the control of the army and its prosecution of the civil war itself remained primarily an internal military matter. Collins, and later Mulcahy, who became Commander-in-Chief following Collins' death, Preoccupied as they were with securing the safety of the new state, uh, uh, with, establishing, sorry, with establishing the army, engendering discipline, prosecuting the war and securing the safety of the new state, paid little attention to the views of other members of the new government. Just as with the old IRA, the early Free State Army was, in practice, an autonomous organisation. A practical reality, which had a technical corollary, as the new army did not have any direct legislative or legal relationship to the government until the passing of the Defence Forces Act in late 1923. So in essence, during its early days, the army gave its allegiance to the Free State, willingly, and in return, the Free State Authority paid the army and supplied it with uh, munitions and um, uh, provisions. But it had no direct legal relationship with the new government. It was, as we said, strictly speaking, an independent organisation. Following the conclusion of the Civil War in April, May 1923, and once the steady, if slow, restoration of order throughout the country appeared to be proceeding, the pro-treaty Sinn Féin government, now renamed Common Gael, turned towards the laborious and expensive task of consolidating the new state. Having begun with a nucleus of roughly 4,000 old IRA men, the numbers within the Free State Army had bloated considerably during the Civil War and it had in the region of 55,000 men under arms uh, at the conclusion of the conflict. Now, sometimes you can have slightly different figures, but roughly 55,000 men. Uh, 
a number that in peacetime simply could not be justified in financial terms. Added to this, Mulcahy, who by 1924 had retained his role as Minister for Defence with the position of Chief of Staff ceded to General Sean McMahon, who was, you can see to your right, was also eager to slim down numbers as he sought to mould the army into a smaller but much more professional and disciplined force. <clears throat> Initial projections envisaged a reduction uh, to approximately 30,000 men in the short to medium term, with a longer term object objective of maintaining a standing army of approximately 18,000 men. Moves by Mulcahy and the Army Council, which was the new three-man governing body of the Irish Army, and the government to institute these changes, both in military numbers and structure, were to meet with opposition from within the army itself. Firstly, and quite understandably, the prospect of losing their positions, positions that afforded men a certain level of prestige within the community, as well as a guaranteed income in what were rather difficult and uncertain economic times, was not welcomed by many within the army. Moreover, those free state officers uh, who had served in the old IRA, some of whom also faced the prospect of demobilization, presented the army authorities with an additional difficulty. Although these men had provided distinguished service during the War of Independence and uh, the Civil War, many of these officers were simply unsuitable for employment in a conventional standing army, the type of professional, disciplined and strictly hierarchical organization that Mulcahy and the Army Council now wanted the army to evolve into. Those very attributes that had made those men, the old IRA men, so successful and useful in prosecuting a guerrilla war against the British, attributes such as self-reliance, a forceful independence of mind, and perhaps a certain disdain for unwelcome authority, were attributes that would only serve to undermine the project of professionalizing the new army. The difficulty for Mulcahy, and as it would emerge the government as a whole, was that many of these old IRA men had not accepted the treaty itself, uh, had not accepted the treaty on the principle of majoritarian democracy itself. Rather, they had accepted it either by virtue of loyalty to their superior officers within the IRA pre-treaty, who had themselves accepted the treaty, or by virtue of their direct loyalty to Michael Collins himself, who was now dead, or perhaps due to the persuasive nature of Collins's stepping stone argument namely that the terms of the agreement with Britain merely amounted to a temporary stopgap measure and that once consolidated, the free state would quickly begin to divest itself of the more odious conditions of the treaty before eventually establishing a 32-county unitary republic. Indeed, the disgruntlement of some of these old IRA officers had begun to surface even before the end of the civil war or the threat of demobilization and unemployment had presented itself. Men such as Frank Thornton, Liam Tobin, and Charles Dal Dalton, uh, all close associates of Michael Collins, these men, men such as these had coalesced in early 1923 to form what was known as the Irish Republican Army Organisation, which was an organisation of ex and old IRA men within the, the new Free State Army. Their stated objective in forming this association was to ensure that old IRA men had, quote, a strong voice in army policy with a view to securing the complete independence of Ireland when a suitable occasion arose." Unquote. To this end, they exhorted their members to take control of key positions within the army and to sideline those officers or soldiers who were not deemed to be of sufficient patriotic mind. Now it is highly likely that their stated objective of securing the total independence of Ireland in, 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 in line with the stepping stone argument was genuine. That's, that's highly likely. However, it is also possible that more personal considerations were also at play. Many of those who would come to join the Irish Republican Army organization were old IRA men who felt aggrieved at being passed over for promotion. Many felt, rightly or wrongly, that they were being sidelined by the army authorities and that in some cases, men who had never fought the British, or worse still, some ex-British army officers, were gaining leadership positions within the Free State Army at the expense of these old IRA men. These old IRA veterans also had another grievance. They suspected, correctly, that the Irish Republican Brotherhood had been reorganized during the Civil War period, and that this secretive organization was active within the army and in, that, in a capacity that was supportive of the general policy of the army authorities. 
The Brotherhood had indeed been revitalised by pro-treaty officers in order to ensure that the organisation's apparatus did not fall under the sway of anti-treaty elements in uh, early during, or during the mid-part of the Civil War. And in the subsequent post-Civil War period, this IRB counted many senior army officers, including the Chief of Staff, Sean McMahon, among its members. So, throughout 1923 and into 1924, the army contained within it two potentially rival factions. One, the IRB, secretive but largely supportive of army policy, supportive of the army council and of Mulcahy as Minister for Defence. The other faction, the Irish Republican Army Organisation, somewhat more transparent and open but becoming more openly critical of army policy and the direction of the government itself. Both of these organisations, however, were hangovers from the revolutionary pre-independence period. Both were demonstrable after-effects of the culture of autonomy that had been fostered or facilitated within the earlier revolutionary movement. And both now existed because the concept of the supremacy of civilian control over the military had not yet permeated all sections of the army. Ultimately, therefore, it was a combination of these internal tensions within the military Concerns regarding the policy direction, or less than Republican direction, of the Common Gael government and the prospect of extensive demobilisation that prompted the Irish Republican Army organisation to adopt a mutinous approach in early 1924. On the 6th of March 1924, W.T. Cosgrave, the President of the Executive Council, received an ultimatum from the Irish Republican Army organisation. It outlined the organisation's view that the Common Gael government was not taking sufficient steps to establish a republic. It demanded that demobilisation within the army be stopped and that the Irish, the, I, I, the Irish Republican Army organisation representatives be allowed to meet the government to discuss the treaty. It also demanded the removal of the army council, which the mutineers clearly believed was under the sway of the IRB, and whose members were the Chief of Staff, Sean McMahon, uh, the Quartermaster General, Sean O'Murhala, and the Adjutant General Garage O'Sullivan. In this ultimatum, which they to which they expected a reply within four days, it was indicated that if the correct signals were not forthcoming from the government, then the mutineers would, quote, take such action that will make clear to the Irish people that we are not renegades or traitors to the ideals that induced them to accept the treaty, unquote. In other words, the direct implication that the mutineers would be prepared to engage in violent action. Following this submission, 49 army officers resigned in sympathy, while a number of others absconded with weapons and ammunition, approximately 35,000 rounds in all. The ultimatum itself had been signed by Charles Dalton and Liam Tobin, two of the original Irish Republican Army organisation founders. Importantly, however, the ultimatum itself had been handed to Cosgrave by Joseph McGrath. McGrath was at that time the Minister for Industry and Commerce in the government. And as, another, and, as, and, as, and as another former associate, uh, a close associate of Collins, he was sympathetic to the mutineers, uh, or to their perspective. Indeed, during, during the months prior to the mutiny itself, he had acted as an unofficial advocate within the government of the Irish Republican Army organization's position, a fact that had greatly annoyed the Minister for Defence, Richard Mulcahy, who viewed this as an unwarranted interference by another minister in, uh, in what he regarded as uh, an internal military matter. The government, with Mulcahy's existent, insistence, initially adopted a firm line, denouncing the mutineers' actions in the Doyle and ordering that all dissidents be arrested. The initial, this initial approach, however, created an immediate potential difficulty for the government. McGrath resigned from the cabinet and publicly criticised the government's response. More danger, dangerous still, perhaps, was that he sought to galvanise support for the mutinous position within the Common Gael party itself, in other words, the party of government, arguing that the mutineers had been misunderstood, that they posed no military threat to the state, that they only sought to advance Ireland's fortunes, and that their primary difficulty was with the machinations of the IRB within the military. Unfortunately for Mulcahy and the Army Council, McGrath's argument proved receptive to two factions within Common Gael. Those who held some sympathy for the mutineers' views on the treaty and the need to move in a more rhetorical Republican direction, but also amongst those more aligned to the then Minister for Home Affairs, Kevin O'Higgins. Uh, 
O'Higgins was no Republican doctrinaire and was not supportive of the mutiny itself. However, he was concerned about the continued existence of the IRB within the army. He was often critical of Mulcahy's actions as Minister for Defence, and he was eager to curtail the power and influence of the military within the state. Thus, for O'Higgins, the mutineer's behaviour presented something of a welcome stick with which he could beat Mulcahy and seek a reorganisation of civil-military relations. The reaction of a significant section of the Common Aguil Party forced the government to now adopt a softer approach towards the mutiny. McGrath was instructed to treat with the mutineers and to inform them that if they returned all stolen weapons and equipment and undertook to desist in any further mutinous behaviour, the incident would be considered resolved and the circumstances of those officers who had resigned in sympathy with the mutineers would be individually reviewed with the implication that such reviews might be positive. Furthermore, in what was likely an additional element of inducement, the government promised to establish a committee of inquiry to investigate the Department of Defence. And in what could be viewed as at least a partial stop to the mutineers' demands, General Ono Duffy, the Garda Commissioner, was appointed as General Officer Commanding of the Army. The Army Council remained in place, however, and likely viewed their own position as unchanged. It is also likely that they regarded uh, O'Duffy's appointment a newly created position as a largely cosmetic uh, gesture. The mutineers' reaction appeared favourable. They issued another document in which, as Valula states, quote, they, repent, they repented and rescinded the original ultimatum. They professed their loyalty and allegiance to the state and accepted the supremacy of civilian authority over the military." Unquote. <clears throat> publicly, the government now also changed tack. Adopting the view, at least in public as I say, that the mutiny had not been a serious threat to the state at all, but rather the foolhardy action of a group of patriots, an action that had been prompted by their perception of mismanagement by the Department of Defence and the Army Council, and due to the existence of a secret group, the IRB, within the Army. Mulcahy, as Minister for Defence and a staunch defender of the position of the Army Council, disagreed with the government's decision. Although he had also previously been willing to adopt a relatively non-confrontational approach towards his disgruntled former comrades from the old IRA, he regarded the ultimatum itself as something of a Rubicon. He argued that the resignations of those officers sympathetic to the mutiny should be accepted and that those who had actually absconded with weapons or abandoned their posts should be court-martialed. Though Mulcahy had always accepted, and would continue to accept, the supremacy of civilian authority over the army, he also maintained the view that it was the purview of the government to formulate and direct military policy in the general sense, and not to micromanage or to directly influence the, uh, the army's organisation or procedures. So in other words, not to be treating directly with the mutineers. Thus, he regarded the government's direct overture to the mutineers as an unwarranted and inappropriate interference in what was now, as far as he was concerned, an internal disciplinary matter. It was this perspective, together with his, with his sense of duty, both to the maintenance of discipline and order within the army, and to ensuring the security of the state itself that would lead to his political downfall. Despite the mutineers' public repentance and the withdrawal of their ultimatum, Mulcahy and the Army Council remained concerned that the dissidents continued to harbour mutinous intentions. These concerns were well founded. Over the coming days, Army Intelligence supplied the Army Council and thus Mulcahy with reports of IR Irish Republican Army Organisation members and known associates engaging in conspiratorial intrigues. References were made to assassination plots, the targeting of ministers and the possibility of a coup d'etat. Consequently, when Mulcahy learned that an influential group of mutineers had organised a meeting at a public house in Dublin on the 19th of March, he, without reference to the rest of the government, authorised the army to first surround the public house and then to enter it and arrest the occupants. Despite initially barricading themselves on the upper floor of the building and brandishing weapons, the mutineers eventually surrendered. The army mutiny had now been brought to a definitive end. Without violence, and military discipline had been ensured, but there would still be casualties. Although this military intervention certainly neutralised the Irish Republican Army organisation, and quite likely forestalled an attempted rebellion or some other act of sedition on the part of the mutineers, it was to prove a bittersweet victory for Mulcahy and the Army Council. 
With Cosgrave indisposed due to illness, the responsibility for leading the government fell to his deputy president, Kevin O'Higgins. Already highly critical of Mulcahy and the army more generally, O'Higgins and others within the cabinet utilised these events to affect their desire for change within the army and the nature of civil-military relations. The government opted not to accept the raid on the public house and the arrest of the mutineers for what it was, namely the restoration of discipline within the army and the protection and security of the state, but instead chose to frame the actions of Mulcahy and the army authorities as a direct contravention of government policy with respect to the mutineers. The government now argued that Mulcahy and the Army Council had exceeded their authority and in so doing had provoked the mutineers or could have provoked the mutineers into violence, violence that may have spread further throughout the country. Subsequently, all three members of the Army Council were dismissed from their posts and Mulcahy resigned as Minister for Defence in protest, though the rest of the cabinet had already determined to seek his resignation in any event. General Ono Duffy, who in the intervening period had seen his position of General Officer Commanding somewhat upgraded to that of Inspector General of the uh, Defence Forces, now became the new Army Supremo, in fact as, as, well, as well as in name. He would prove much more, ame more amenable to uh, government oversight than Mulcahy or the Army Council had been. As for the Irish Republican Brotherhood, it was ordered to disband. Secret societies, no matter how benign, were no longer to be tolerated within the Armed Forces. Therefore, in what amounted to a bizarre and unjust turn of events, the government chose to victimise and to punish the very people whose actions had served to protect that government and to uphold its authority. Ironically, and perhaps somewhat paradoxically, paradoxically given his position as Minister for Defence, his close relationship with the Army Council, and his personal standing amongst the vast majority of the army that he had helped to establish and to lead, it is very possible that if Mulcahy and the Army Council had opted to resist the government's attempts to dismiss them, they could have resisted those successfully. Despite the attitude of those such as O'Higgins, the reality was that the government still relied on the army as the ultimate bulwark against anti-treatyite dissent or widespread social disorder. Prior to the mutiny, the relative independence of the army, represented as it was at cabinet level by Mulcahy, who was in effect an army man, meant that most within government would have viewed their control over the military as somewhat tenuous, and certainly as insufficient. The decision to dismiss both the Army Council and Mulcahy was an exercise in exerting greater control over the military and in solidifying that sense of control. But it is arguable that it was only due to the strict, the strict acceptance of the primacy of civilian authority on the part of Mulcahy and the Army Council that the government was in a position to actually implement this rather unjust decision at all. So what were the primary consequences of the army mutiny and the events surrounding it? Well, aside from the very personal and negative consequences accruing to Mulcahy and to the Army Council, uh, there appear to have been two other major uh, consequences. Firstly, as aforementioned, as aforementioned, it resulted in an almost immediate rebalancing of civil-military relations. The government, now minus Mulcahy, were able to exert a greater collective influence over army policy and army direction. Though this was undoubtedly uh, positive from the perspective of those who valued the, the importance of civilian, primacy, civilian supremacy and the solidification and maintenance of democratic structures, it had, a neg it had negative long-term effects on the army itself. Despite their control now over the military, this government and successive governments adopted an approach to military affairs that amounted to a form of controlled desiccation, if not exactly outright emasculation. Following his recovery and return as head of government, Cosgrave also acted as Minister for Defence for several months, later appointing a new Defence Minister, Peter Hughes, a man with no military and perhaps also little administrative experience. Whether this was to ensure that the, that the Defence portfolio now had a totally neutral, unattached civilian overseer, or because Cosgrave intended to keep surreptitious but direct personal control over the army, cannot be stated with certainty. However, as Professor Yunin O'Halpin has observed, the decision to appoint Hughes as minister appeared to institute what would become a policy of calculated neglect of military affairs. From this point onwards, the army suffered from perennial underinvestment and would never again regain the primacy or level of power it had held within Irish society from 1922 until 1924.
Secondly, the events surrounding the mutiny resulted in the hardening of what John Regan refers to as the consolidationist pro-treatyite position at the expense of the more republican position within the Commonwealth organization, a development that arguably contributed to that party's eventual decline and loss of power to what would become its arch rivals Fianna Fáil. As we observed, Joe McGrath's attitude towards the ostensible objectives of the mutineers and his response to the government's initial hard line demonstrated that the more nationalistic or republican pro-treatyite interpretation of the treaty, the so-called stepping stone argument, was not only represented by him at the cabinet table, but also had support within the parliamentary party. Later, he along with eight other Commonwealth deputies would leave the organisation and form the National Party, which was effectively a pro-treatyite republican organisation. In 1925 they resigned their seats in order to prompt by-elections and to gauge the level of public support for their position. They lost all their seats. Importantly, however, whilst Common and Wales regained seven of those nine seats, two of them, two of the seats, were captured by the anti-treaty Sinn Féin organisation, which at that stage still didn't even recognise the existence of the state as legitimate. Again, while the loss of McGrath and the others did not prove to be a serious threat to Common and Wales' position in the short term, it was clear that a certain element of the more republican, or the more greener, if you will, wing of the Commonwealth Party uh, had now split away from it, arguably bringing a portion of that support base in terms of votes with them. It is virtually certain that some of these elements switched their allegiance to Fianna Fáil after that party emerged in 1926. Moreover, when de Valera's republican-sounding organisation accepted the legitimacy of the state, and once in power, began to dispense with the more odious aspects of the treaty, aspects that the consolidationist elements within Common Aguil had proved reluctant to address during their decade in government, those voters who would switch to Fianna Fáil would find little to attract them back to Common Aguil. The party was in decline, and despite a reorganisation and a name change in 1933, would remain becanned until the late 1940s. The events of the army mutiny contributed this decline, at least in part. I'm not letting you go yet. What if? I promise you, we're getting near the end, but what if? Uh, a, little, a, little, a little short experiment in, in intellectual conjecture, because I think sometimes these things are worthwhile. So, what if the army mutiny had happened? What if Mulcahy and the army council had chosen to adhere to what was apparently government policy to simply leave the mutineers alone. And so what if the mutineers had been allowed or facilitated to continue in their conspiratorial activities and therefore to, uh, to attempt a coup d'etat or to attempt some form of um, uh, uh, attack on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the government? Well, firstly, it would be a mistake to simply look at the mutiny in, at the time in isolation. That is to say, outside of the wider international context. Just months before the mutineers decided to first establish the Irish Republican organization in 1923, Mussolini had marched on Rome and initiated a fascist takeover of the Italian state. And just four months before the botched mutiny here, the Nazis had initiated their failed putsch in Munich. Now, of course, it would be a mistake to suggest that Mussolini, uh, Mussolini's successful takeover in Rome or Hitler's failure in Munich had any direct effect on the mindset of the mutineers here. But it is important to consider that Ireland, with a little more bad luck or a little less decisive leadership, could perhaps have gone in the same direction as many of the other new states that emerged in Europe following the uh, ending of the First World War. While it is unlikely that the mutineers would have ultimately uh, been successful had they attempted to spring a coup d'etat in 1924, it is possible they could have kidnapped or perhaps even assassinated some of the leading and perhaps less security conscious members of the government. This, thus, may well have precipitate, precipitated the emergence of Mulcahy as a Collins-like figure, utilising his hold over the vast majority of the army as a method by which to institute a militarily directed, if not necessarily militarily dictated, government in order to destroy this new threat to the state. A threat that may have been for, further bolstered by the reactivation of the, din, of the, the then dormant, but still very bitter and still existing anti-treaty IRA movement. They hadn't gone away, you know which still retained most of the arms it had held at the end of the Civil War. And in this scenario, 
Even if the concept of civilian primacy had remained intact, a factor that would have arguably only been maintained thanks to Mulcahy's personality, in such a scenario, the open conflict within the free state forces would certainly have given courage to the, those sections of the anti-treaty IRA to renew their campaign to try and take over the state. Irrespective of Mulcahy's personality or adherence to the primacy of civilian government, the almost certain outcome of any three-way civil war would have been a more militarised Irish state and perhaps one that was somewhat contemptuous of weak politicians that had proved unable or unwilling to root out mutiny or to control its own armed forces in 1924. A state that would have been all the more susceptible, therefore, to the type of authoritarian style of governance that began to gain greater purchase throughout Europe later in the 1930s. Now, of course, this is a matter of conjecture. And given what we know of Mulcahy's personality, it is probable that if Mulcahy had emerged as a Collins-like strongman to lead the army and the remnants of the government in such a aforementioned scenario, the likelihood is that Mulcahy would not have, in the aftermath, sought to, con sought to consolidate all governmental powers to himself. Mulcahy's adherence to the concept of majoritarian democracy was too strong for that. It would, however, have likely convinced Mulcahy that the army did need to remain somewhat autonomous in order to prevent such a scenario, one where political mismanagement had facilitated mutiny in the first place, from occurring, uh, from occurring again. Consequently, while it is unlikely that this more militarised, though still democratic, Irish state, with Mulcahy as commander-in-chief, uh, would have gravitated towards the more authoritarian style of governance that became prominent later while he was in charge, we cannot say with confidence, uh, with respect, we cannot, we cannot say, we cannot with confidence make a similar conjectural prediction with respect to Mulcahy's successor in this alternative timeline, whoever that may have been. So in conclusion, the circumstances of the Army Mutiny of 1924, together with uh, its non-violent conclusion, serve to suppress and eventually eliminate the type of independent and autonomous mindset that elements within the new Irish Army had inherited from its old IRA progenitor. A mindset that had, in somewhat similar ways, not only prompted the actions of the mutineers, but had also contributed to Mulcahy's tendency to try and limit the involvement of other members of government in Army affairs. As Professor Valoulis has observed, the Army Mutiny of 1924 was the final echo of the Civil War, at least in military terms. It represented the last vestige of the volunteer mentality and of an independent, politically orientated army. Importantly, however, this relatively benign conclusion masks somewhat the unjust consequences that befell Mulcahy and the Army Council. The case of Mulcahy is particularly important as his mistreatment at this time is somewhat symbolic of the extent to which he is not accorded the level of respect and renown within popular history that he arguably, arguably deserves. As Valoulis' excellent biography of Mulcahy attests, following the death of Michael Collins in August 1922, no single individual was more crucial than Mulcahy in prosecuting the civil war, ensuring the safety and security of the infant state, and defending its democratic ideals. Moreover, his commitment to the primacy of civilian authority and the legitimacy of Parliament was such that in 1924 he, was, uh, he, he willingly sacrificed his own career to protect them both. Irrespective of one's political views today, or whether uh, anyone who, subs subs who subscribes to or supports the concept of liberal democracy in this country owes Richard Mulcahy a debt of gratitude. Thank you.